at uh, the book of Luke today. Uh, so if you turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 17. Uh, 
uh, you know, get enough, you would get like this bacterial infection and it would form this like numb, tumor-like patch on you and then it would spread to other patches on you until the point it would even be on your face, right? And so if you look at uh, people who had leprosy that was advanced and it was on their face, there were like tumors really, and numb tumors that were all over their face. And so, um, well, what happened, because people didn't want to catch this disease, right? They didn't know how really diseases even worked back then, let alone antibiotics and other things that we have now. And so they just avoided it, right? You just isolate, you just quarantine, and you isolate them. The lepers were always kicked outside. There were, there were these city walls that protected against wild beasts, right, from coming into the city, right? Well, they would banish the lepers outside of the city gates, right? And they were left in the wilderness, and then what would often happen is that the wild animals, right, that were out there in the wilderness, they wouldn't even, while they were sleeping, come and even chew on the numb flesh of the lepers, right? And, you know, why wouldn't they wake up? Well, it was numb, right? They couldn't even feel it when it happened like this. And so, you know, this is often why actually lepers die of other diseases. And if you think about an animal chewing on you, you would die of a, a diseases that come from the like this, right? And so this is often what happened to lepers. And so, you know, when you think about it, people were really scared of being near lepers, and so they isolated them, but, you know, that wasn't the Lord, right? That wasn't Jesus. He reached out, he went even close to these lepers, right? He crossed, you know, we see going to the Samaritan region, we see this even going to the lepers, he crossed social and physical boundaries, and he reached out really to the marginalized ones, right? He reached out to the ones that could not be loved, the ones that were isolated. This is the love of the Lord that reached even these people, right? Even the Gentiles, right? Just like moving to the Gentiles. Uh, we see the love of the Lord that goes to all of these people. And so that is why we have to know that you know, for us as well, too, Jesus is reaching out to us as well. So, right? We see that actually there are so many lepers in this era. And not only that, not only are there so many lepers in this era, we can be the lepers in this era. Now why? You know, why can we say that we are lepers in this era? Because, you know, if you look at the disease that we have, it is sin. Right? We have sin inside of us. And sin is exactly like this. It is a sickness that is spreading in us, right? It's like a virus that slowly infects us. Maybe we don't even show signs and symptoms at first. If you look at lepers, you know, before they were like cast out, they often had these patches maybe underneath their body. It wouldn't show until later on their face, right, that people could see. And so maybe even, you know, the sickness that we have, the sin, if you look at the sin that we have, maybe it's not really exactly shown outwardly, even to ourselves or to others, but it is spreading, right? It is spreading, and we don't even, sometimes we don't even know about it. It's like, no, like lepers, they were numb, right? And so sometimes, even when it starts to show, we don't even know because we are so numb to sickness. You know, that is how sin is. When we have sin inside of us, Right? The sin, we can't even be known to that sin. But, you know, it is growing. Right? It is growing. It is a bit of pride, let's say. It could be a little bit of anger that, you know, is lust as well too, or greed, you know, these type of things. And so, you know, this sin, the sin that is inside of us and that is spreading, what does it do? Well, we need to know that, first of all, it does isolate us from God. We are separated from God because of sin. Right? We become isolated. We, we separate ourselves. It's like the, the, the lepers who are outcasts, we get separated from God because of sin. And so, you know, actually, when you look at this world, I actually think, you know, it's, it's, it's quite probably the opposite of what we think. We, we probably, you know, if you look at this world, we think it's like, you know, crowded full of people and everything. But, you know, when you look at this world, there's actually, I think, one big giant leper colony. You know, I think that's a better way to describe it. It's a leper colony of diseased and isolated people. And so this is what we call a fallen world, right? When we say that we live in a fallen world, this is another way that we can describe it. We can say that it is one big giant. 
I can never recall. And so, you know, this is something you can sometimes feel. Like, have you ever felt this before? Like, you, know, you can be around a lot of people, right? You know, you can be around a lot of people, but still feel really, really isolated from, from others, right? From one another. You can still feel lonely, even when there's like a ton of people around you. They say, you know, for example, the city of Tokyo, right? Like, Tokyo is one of the hugest, like, largest, most populated cities in the world. But if you look it up, and it's one of the loneliest places. You know, isn't that you know unbearable to think? I mean, you have millions and millions of, of people, like 20 million people or something like that in, in Tokyo. But you know, the big problem in the city is that you know people feel lonely, right? Even though there's so many people around. And so you know, that's the same. You know, if you look at that city, you know, that's actually the same for all of us. We have this kind of modern phenomenon when you look at uh, the world, social media world that we live in right now. I mean, in fact, you can say that there is a social media induced loneliness that occurs among young people and it's around society right now. Like, you know, we are more connected to, to other people than ever before. Like, you know, I grew up when, you know, we just first started, you know, having, uh, you know, little websites and, you know, chatting, you know, we had this type of thing, technology that came out when I, you know, became an adult, became a teenager. And, and so, you know, now it's even way more advanced than that. And so we're more connected to people, yet, you know, so many people still speak about, you know, loneliness, right? Loneliness inside of them. And so, uh, when I was a third grader, as well, too, um, I moved to a new school, right? And so uh, I was uh, in a new school, and so because it was new school new people, um, you know, I was bullied, actually, you know, at that time. But why? Well, you know, first of all, my name, you know, it's a walker, you know, this is not a common name. And so they made up all kinds of things, like, what are you walking? You walking for a dog or something like that? And so they would say things like that. I think this is what kids, they would come up with, right? And so they made fun of my name, they, they made fun of my clothes, too, you know, because, you know, I bought my, all, all my clothes from, you know, like, like from Asia or something like that. And so they go, you know, what kind of clothes are you wearing? And so this is the kind of thing you know, that kids do. And so, you know, I remember feeling very isolated, um, you know, when I was in third grade going to attending school. But then, you know, of course, you know, through time I made some friends and I overcame that kind of period. But then, you know, what happened when I was in middle school, actually, was that, you know, I became actually guilty of bullying others, right? So, I, I still remember, there was like this, this, this kid, right? And he was like bullied by a bunch of people and I wanted to like, you know, somehow show that I was part of the game, right? That does this, and so you know, he would. He, he there was this one time I still, still in my memory. I don't know. I think I, you know, when you're a kid, you remember these, these kind of bad things that you did, and so he sat down on the chair, right? And then I pulled the chair, you know, under him, and then he he, he fell down like that, and so you know, everyone laughed at him and things like that, and so you know, I became guilty of this, and so you know, this is how you know. I mean, you might think, oh, this is like. You know, tiny kids things, but you know, actually, when you look at the world, it's, it's all the same. Like, it's all the same. It's like just different. It's like a different forms and different things, right? You can be around a lot of people, but still feel so alone. And so, you know, that's what leprosy is, right? We need to know that this is a disease that exists, and that it's not. It's not just like a, a disease where only like you know a couple people have, but here we see that ten people have. Right, ten people, that's a lot, you know, when you look at it. And so, you know, there are, what is a leper colony? So a leper colony has people, there's like ten people here. But even, I think, amongst themselves, they must feel even isolated from, you know, one another. And that's what sin does. You know, this is what sin does. Sin is isolation from God. It is an incurable disease, right? And, you know, I, I think it is, you know, something like that. I think, you know, if you look at loneliness, you know, the loneliness that we have inside of our hearts, you know, it's the same thing. It is like an incurable disease inside of this world. With our focus on greed or the greed of money, right, or uh, uh, lust and, and power and fame, and, and when we tend to focus on these things, actually, like, as we do focus on those things, what it breeds is more loneliness, right? 
Like, like you think you, you gain some moral edge, right? Like you gain more money, or you gain more power or fame. And they say actually, like, you know, even those like social media stars these days, like, you know, you, you were not famous before, but suddenly on social media, you became famous, and then you're like really well known. They say one of their problems is that they feel now isolated and lonely. And more people know them than ever, but you know, they can't even go out in public, they feel very lonely, they can't do the things that they used to be able to do. And so, you know, you really look at it, and these things don't, don't solve like the fundamental problem on the inside, right? And so, you know, like, like you, you pursue all of these things, but you know, the fundamental problem of loneliness doesn't get resolved. Right? It doesn't get resolved. It's like an inside thing, right? You try to solve it with outside things. Like you have outside things, you have money, you have things, you solve it with outside things, but the inside thing, right? The deep loneliness that we have inside of us, this doesn't get resolved, right? And so that's the sickness. And so that's why it's a lumber colony, right? It's like full of people, like 10 people here. It's full of people, but they're all lonely, right? They can't even rely on one another. You know, isn't that how sad the world is? Like, there's a lot of people outside of the world, but you can't even rely on other people in the world. And so, you know, everyone, they, they gain hurt from this, I think, throughout their life. You can gain hurt from this. Like, you make relationships with your friends. Like, people feel you isolated from their own family, even. You know, hearing stories about this, like, you know, even from their own family, you know, feeling isolated and lonely in their heart. And so, you know, these 10 lepers, you know, as we look, you know, we need to know that this is what they're suffering from, right? Like, there is the physical disease that they're suffering from, but we need to know that even more than that, that they're, they're facing a, a, a deep loneliness, right? There's a deep heart, deep spiritual disease that they're facing. And so that's why we can understand lepers, right? You might think, well, I don't understand lepers. They're, you know, that's a disease that we don't have in the modern world. But, you know, when you think about it, the heart that they are feeling, you no, know, that's exactly, that's exactly the same heart that so many, so many people feel in this, in this world right now. And so that's why we need to know that, you know, actually the story of the lepers, we can feel it. Right? We know it, and we can feel it, and this is what the world is, is, is living in, the fallen world is living in. And so, you know, through this, though, right, through this, deep feeling of isolation and, and loneliness out in the wilderness. Um, one of the things that does develop, though, is they hear about Jesus, they want to go towards him, right? They call out Jesus, Master, have pity on us, right? That is in verse 12, right? And, well, that's verse 13, we're going to read that in a second. So let's read verse 13 and verse 14. So let's look at Luke chapter 17, and in verse 13 and verse 14. And called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And they went, and they were cleansed. And so what happens is they call out to Jesus, right? They have this desire, they have this heart to call out to the Lord. They're so lonely. And so they call out to the Lord to heal, you know, have pity on us, heal us of this leprosy. And so Jesus. What does he say? He says, uh, go show yourselves to the priests. And so this has a meaning as well. Also, so long ago, you know, there was like leprosy. I mean, you know, I mean, it's po it was possible for it, you know, to be healed like, naturally, right? I mean, there, there, were, there were possible. I mean, it wasn't a cure. They didn't have a cure for it. But some people, of course, they were able to overcome their leprosy because, you know, the body also has its own immune system and fighting. And so, if you were healed of the leprosy, well, one thing that you would do in order to be, you know, you were in isolation before, right? And now you need to come back into society because you were healed of it. Well, what they would do is they would go before the priests, right? And so the priests would come and inspect them, and as long as the priests affirm that, okay, this person is healed, then uh, they were allowed to come back to society. And so, you know, that's what Jesus is saying here, right? He says, you know, go show yourselves to the priest, right? And so, you know, the, the meaning is, is you're healed, right? You're, you're going to be healed. You can go back and enter. You won't have to be lonely anymore. You can go back into society. And so they uh, ran off and, and, and went off to the priest. And 
So here's something that we need to see as uh, we look at today's message. So the first thing is, is that uh, we see the important thing is that they cry out to Jesus for help. And they cry out to Jesus for help. So as we look at our lives of faith as well too, this has to be our starting point, right? So think about it. If I don't even know that I'm sick, then why should I see a doctor for help, right? You know, if I don't even know that I'm sick, then I don't even need, think I need to go get medicine. I don't even think I need to get a doctor to get healed. And so we look and then we see and we understand that a precursor to faith and to true healing is this kind of humility, right? It's the humility that I need to be healed, that I need to be saved. And that my healing is not something that I can do on my own, that I can resolve on my own with my own ability. And so, you know, if we look at it, this is the recognition of my own spiritual need. It's not that I can cure my spiritual leprosy on my own, right? So think about it, the deep loneliness. So I have this, we, we, we've recognized this, we've talked about this, that leprosy is this isolation and this loneliness. Right, it's a separation that we have. And so, you know, that that which sin causes, that in which we live in this, you know, leper colony world, you know, we need to know that, you know, you know, this is not something we can resolve on our own, right? That you know, we can try various things, we could, you know, you know, you know, we, we could try a lot of things, right? To try to, you know, if I feel this like loneliness, I feel this like isolation inside of me, we people try different things. They say, Oh, I need to go find a, a new friend group, right? You know, I need to go find new friends, like find new friend groups, right? And so you think, well, that, that would be a way to cure my loneliness, right? I'm not really lonely, and so, you know, I have to find new friends, right? And so, you know, you, you, you and then, you know, this is something I thought when I was, especially when I was in college, I think, like, like most young people are, you know, when I was just, like, 19, 20 years old in college, I thought, oh, I could, I could resolve this cure through a romantic relationship, right? So, you know, I find a, a romantic relationship, and then suddenly, you know, my, my, my loneliness. You know, I have it. I was really lonely. I think I, I don't know, a lot of people went to a public, you know, public university, so tens of thousands of people all around me, but still feeling inside of me like fundamentally lonely. So I thought, oh, find new friends, find a romantic relationship, or something like that, right? And so, you know, actually, you know, that's, that's the reason why actually people come to church as well also. So they come to church and they, they it, it's like a new friend group, right? It's like a new friend group, right? So I have a new friend, I have a new friend group. And of course that's true, that, that is an aspect of our church. We do meet brothers and sisters and it's new friends that we meet. But, you know, there's something that we need to know about why we go to church. That it's more than just finding a, a, a new friend group because you know, there is a fundamental loneliness, right, that cannot be resolved with just, like, people, right, with people. And so, you know, the Bible points to us and teaches us that God is love, right, that's only through God. That, you know, if you look at us, that the reason why we are fundamentally lonely, why the internal part, right, why we're lonely, that even if we have a lot of friends, even if we do have that romantic relationship or whatever we have, like, that's not going to solve it. That, you know, on the fundamentally speaking, what the Bible teaches us is that we are fallen. It's because we were created. God created us in His image, and God is love. And so we are meant from the beginning in our spirits, in our hearts. You know, whether you acknowledge God or not, you know, we were created by God. That's what the Bible teaches us, right? And so, you know, we were, since we were created by the God of love, in love, it's having a loving relationship. But then what happens? Sin. Sin cuts off that loving relationship with him. And so this is why we're fundamentally lonely. Right? Because there's something going on on the inside. Right? Whether we know it or not, it's not about your knowledge. It's not about what you know. It's there. Right? It's already there. <laughs> it exists whether or not you acknowledge it or not. This already exists and we, we live in this fallen world and it already exists. And so our acknowledgement of that is just simply speaking, if I'm, if I'm going to wise up or not, if I'm going to read the Bible, right? And I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to read the Bible, I'll open up myself and be humble and say, hey, I need salvation. 
And so that's what's going on here with lovers. That's what's very precious about them, right? It's not about whether they, you know, you know, you know for us, it's about humbly acknowledging that because it already exists. It's already there. This is how we were created, and this is the fallen nature that we have as we live in this world. And so, you know, when we really, really understand that this exists, and that, you know, I need salvation, then we can be like these lepers, and we can say, well, how then? If I have sin, and I can't, it's not like I'm going to resolve it all myself. It's not, like, it's, it's not as if I'm going to resolve this fundamental loneliness on myself. Then how is it that I can resolve it? How can I be saved? Well, then the Bible teaches us that as well, too. That it's only through His Son, Jesus Christ. It is only through the Lord. It is only through His Son, Jesus that God, He is up there, and then we are isolated from Him down here. But God sent His Son to us, right, on Christmas to us. And so, Jesus is the answer to our loneliness. When I have Jesus in my life, when I accept, when I have Jesus in my life, then this is what fundamentally resolves, and this is, uh, this is what we need, right? And so, the beautiful part about this is I don't have to do any work in order to do this, right? It's not like I really have to, like, you know, climb mountains in order to have Jesus. Actually, he is immediately present. He's, the, he's, he's the one walking by us, right? And, you know, you look at today's message, and that's what's going on, right? Jesus walked to the region of Samaria. He walked to this little colony. And so, you know, when we, when we really look at it in our lives, it's not that we have to do anything great in order to be. He is immediate to us. He is right there. He's just like walking. He's walking right by me. All I have to do is call and accept him into my heart like this. He came to where no one else would come. He came to my isolated heart, right? Where I was lonely and I was, you know, isolated and depressed and I had all of these things inside of my heart. And I felt like no one could come to this place. And maybe I was trying to seek like another person, like, oh, I, I want a friend, or I want a you know, romantic relationship, or I want some of these things to come into that place. Well, you know, relying on simple humans, we come, we come to find that that's not the way. That's not, that's not the way. It is only through Jesus who is immediate to us. Right? Jesus Christ is the answer. He came swiftly and he came effectively through grace. Uh, and that's unconditional love. Right? That's what it means, the unconditional love of Jesus. There was no condition. Right? There is unconditional means there is no condition that grace came to us unconditionally. And that grace that was foreign to the world, it was very foreign, especially to us sick lepers, unloved and isolated in this world. But he came unconditionally by taking the gruesome cross. You know, even as gruesome as leprosy was. The cross is more gruesome. The, 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 the Lord took up the gruesome cross, the gruesome sin that we all had. He bore it when we didn't deserve it. And unconditionally, he didn't even expect payback for it, right? He just gave it to us freely. You know, this is paradoxically opposite from, you know, this world, this transactional nature of this world that we live in. You know, we look at the relationships that we have. Well, why can't these things be solved by human relationships? And why is it that, you know, human relationships won't solve our loneliness? Well, the reason why is because you look at this world and the relationships we have are so transactional. This is something I noticed as I grew older and older. I mean, maybe, you know, your parents, your parents can be a little bit more, you know, and of course, I, I don't know many one of your situations. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you didn't experience this as much, but, you know, I could I thank my parents. Parents were were loving me, so okay. So I received this kind of love, and then as I grew into adulthood, I really realized, well, it's actually very transactional. You know, it's, it's very transactional, right? And so, you know, relationships come with some type of strings that are attached like this, right? But you know, what did Jesus show us? He showed us the kind of grace and kindness and relationship that it's not like some kind of commodity. It's not something that can be transactional transacted, but it was a condition. And so, it helps us really now understand, you know, why coming to church, right? So the relationships that we have, brothers, why is it like church is not just another friend group, right? It's not just like a place where I just get another friend group. 
And so, you know, for me, coming to church, I experienced like all these transactional, like sort of expectation-driven friend relationships that, that I had. And then coming to church, it was it was very new. It's like, oh, like it's very new. I, I thought, you know, I was, I was actually pretty skeptical, you know, because I think I've, I've said this to you guys before, I was not a Christian before, never went to church. So I started going to church in my early 20s, like this when I was like 19, actually. Um, but when I started going to church, and then I was like, very skeptical. I was like, why are these people so nice to me? You know, I mean, I was like really jaded, like experiencing worldly relationships, right? You know, coming to adulthood, and then suddenly all these people are like really nice to me. Like, what do they want? You know, it's like, what do they want from me? Like, why are they so nice? What do they actually, like, what's this actually, what do they actually like want, you know, from me? And so, you know, my heart was, was closed at first, but you know what happened? I was hearing the word of, of God, I realized, like, understanding about Jesus accepting Jesus and understanding about Jesus, I realized, well, they have, they all, it's because they all have the love of Jesus inside of them, right? This is why. And so the answer is Jesus, that, you know, even if we're all sinners, and even if you look at, at brothers and sisters, like in church, right? Brothers and sisters in church, actually, to a certain extent, we're going to do the same thing as the world. Like, we're not perfect. You know, we're all sinners here, even in church, as brothers and sisters do. So, to a certain extent, when we treat each other, you know, there's going to be some transactional nature. There's going to be some legalism and, and lawful things and sort of expectation-driven. You know, to expect, like, you know, our brothers and sisters all to be, like, unconditional with love is you know, probably asking too much because, you know, to a certain extent, we're all sinners as well, too. But, you know, what is different? The difference is that for us, we're all accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so with that overflowing in us, it's with our heart. It's with our heart overflowing with that, right? And so you see that that comes out as a light, right? That even if we are sinners, if the love of Jesus comes into us, then perhaps, you know, just a, a part, a part of Jesus overflowing out of us, that unconditional love of Jesus, perhaps, a, a, perhaps some of that love can overflow to my brother. And then so that's, that's what we feel and what we see that is different among brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. It's different, you know, from the world. It's not because of us. We're sinners. We're going to actually treat each other a little bit like we do in the world to a certain extent. But what we are feeling and what we are seeing is not people's love, but it's the love of Jesus. Right? It's a part. It's a portion. It's, a, it's the love of Jesus overflowing in us. And so that's why Jesus is the answer. I'm not the answer. I'm not the answer, but Jesus. Jesus is the answer. That even if we're all sinners, we can treat each other in church in some way, or in some fashion, like the unconditional love of Jesus. And, and in some fashion, if all of us do it together, then as a church, as a body of Christ, then we can exhibit that unconditional love to one another and to lost souls in the world too. And so that's why, you know, even when we're weak, you know, actually, that's how it is. We're all like weak, like doing it, even as a body of Christ, even as a church. We're also going to be weak in terms of that. But the grace that we have is that still the Holy Spirit, the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit fills us up on our weakness, right? And so the Holy Spirit is still going to be there. Even when we are weak, doing it to one another, the Holy Spirit is still going to be there helping us, right? Filling up us. And so uh, we see that. So let's we'll read the last part now. Let's look at Luke chapter 17 and in verse 15 through 19. Luke chapter 17, verse 15 through 19. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go your faith. So, ten were healed on the road. Perhaps, you know, as the Jesus is applying here, perhaps some of them even were Jews, right? Jews that were, like, you know, isolated, and so they had to go to this region of Samaria, right? But then, among them, there were just one, right? This foreigner, right? This foreigner that was healed. Then. I don't know if this foreigner means he was a Samaritan, or he could have even just straight from a Gentile, right? That was in this area, too. And so, you know, ten were healed on the road, but only one comes back, right? And others, um, they're on the road. Remember, she's told them, go show yourself to the priest. They're on the road to the priest. They're 
heal along the way. Um, one seeing that he heals comes back, and the others just kind of keep on going. And so one came thanking Jesus, and then Jesus, he wonders, you know, why, why is it like this? Why is it that the other nine didn't give praise? I didn't give praise, didn't give thanks, in other words, back to God. And so Jesus is saying something very, very important in our faith as we look at it here. He says, your faith has made you well. Right? Your faith has made you well. This is something he's, you know, so the why, right? We're asking why he is saying, you know, to this person that did come back, your faith has made you well. Right? And so what is that? That faith, remember, where we've been talking about the heart, we've been talking about the loneliness in our heart, faith is in the heart. So, in other words, if you look at these ten here, all ten, all ten receive physical healing from their leprosy, right? All ten receive physical healing from their leprosy. But, only one was healed, their whole person was healed, right? So ten received physical healing, but only one was their whole person that was, that was saved, right? That was healed. And so, as we look at our lives of faith, what is salvation? What is salvation, right? So Jesus, he died on the cross to save me from my sin, right? So it is from sin. We have sin inside of us, right? And so, you know, when we look at being saved, we are being saved from our sin. But, you know, let's look at this deeper, though, also. You know, Jesus, he came to this earth as a baby, born in a manger, right, on Christmas, right? On Christmas, he was born as a baby in a manger. And so, you know, why? If, if it was just like for sin, couldn't it have been some, some other way? But it had to be through Jesus. It had to be through the person of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, on Christmas, one of the things we're, you know, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, sort of praying to this a bit, one of the things that we look at as we walk towards Christmas is the whole person of Jesus. Right? It's the person of who Jesus is, the person of Jesus Christ. Because he was born as a person, born in a manger on Christmas, right? And so when you look at our salvation, we have to look deeper, right? There is my salvation from my sin, but we also have to look at, sa at saving, at the saving of me as a whole person from the darkness of the world, right? Jesus came as a person, and I am a person, right? I'm not just me as defined by my actions, right? I'm just not, not me just defined by my sin. Right? If you look at yourself, like a lot of people think like that. They, they look at themselves and I was saved by Jesus, and as long as I'm saved from my sin, right, then I'm you know, then that, that is enough. But like think about it, like me as a whole person, am I just defined by my actions? Am I just defined by my sin? No, if we look at ourselves as a whole person, of course we think a lot more nuanced, a lot deeper things about me, my thoughts and you know, my hopes and, and all of this, this stuff that I have inside of me, right? And then so, you know, if we look at this, this same exact scene and we try to apply it to ourselves, we can apply it even to believers of Jesus Christ. We come to realize what this means, that there were nine that were healed outwardly, right? But only one, their whole person was healed. And so, you know, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, and so I'm going to heaven, right? I'm going to heaven, right? And then, but then, you know, what do I do? I just, you know, keep going on my way, uh, going back to society. Right? I mean, that's what, the, that's what essentially nine of them did. They were healed physically, but then they just went back to basically life like it was before. I mean, just without the medicine, just without the sickness. And so, you know, really, the weekend, you know, that, that's what happens to us well. I mean, am I just like, okay, so I'm, I'm healed of my sin. I believe in Jesus. I'm going to heaven. I'm just healed of my sin. But then I just go on living in the world like it was before, right? Like my life, my whole life, my whole person actually hasn't really like changed. All, all my whole person hasn't changed. You know, I've been saved from my sin, but actually has my life actually changed? And that's what we have to think about. I've been saved from my sin, but has my life actually changed? Or am I just similar to all the leper colony people in the world? You know, we have to go back to the Lord. You know, that's what this is talking about. The, 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 the one, right? The one, what happened? He went to the Lord first, and then he got healed, and then he went off, and then he went back again, right? He went back again to the Lord, right? 
And so, you know, clearly, you know, this, this, you know, we have to go, that's what we have to do as well too. We have to go back to the Lord. You know, that we have to go back to the Lord who not only saves me from my sin, but he saves my whole person. He saves my life, right? That's what Jesus does. He saves my life, right? We have to think about that. It's not just my actions and my sin. That's a critical key important part. I, I go to heaven. I receive righteousness through Jesus Christ. But he's also saving my whole life, my whole life transformed, right? And so, you know, clearly as we go back and we look at this person whose whole life, this whole person was actually changed, right? Not just his leprosy, but the whole person and through faith and everything, he, the whole person was saved. You know, what is the sign that he was saved, right? And so we come to find that it's not actually any great action he performed, but what we do see that he has is just simply speaking, gratitude, right? That's what he has, he comes back, you know, where was where were the other nine? Was no one to have found to return and give praise to God? He gave gratitude, in other words, right? So true, deep gratitude in the heart that genuinely, genuinely overflowed, that genuine overflowing heart coming back to Jesus, right? So the other nine out of the ten, did they not have gratitude? Well, I think you know probably, you know, so think about it. They called on Jesus, they really needed him for that healing, right? And so probably that's what happened and when they were on the road and they got healed. They probably said, thanks. Thank you, Lord. I don't know what Jesus heard it, but, you know, whatever. Anyways, thank you, thanks, right? But, you know, what is that? That is just like token acknowledgement, right? And then just going back on. Right? So they said, thanks. I think they probably were thankful, like, oh, I got healed with my leprosy, thanks. But then they just went on, right? But what I want to say is that there is a big difference between thanks and thanksgiving. Right? Once again, there is a big difference between thanks and thanksgiving. Right? So one is, can just be this token acknowledgement, like, oh, you know, thanks, Lord, and just move on and go back to you know, society, to the priest, and to the society like that. And the other is overflowing thanksgiving. Right? And so what is thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is genuine love from the heart that overflows, right? If we think about Thanksgiving and what the meaning of Thanksgiving is, we think about the true heart of love that is overflowing, the true heart of Jesus, because our love is insufficient. We need the love of unconditional love of Jesus. So it's having the unconditional love of Jesus inside of us overflowing. And so, you know, when we think about it again, going back to our salvation, did I just receive salvation from Jesus and then I said, thanks, Jesus, and then just go on, right? And that's what's happening when you really look at so many believers, it's like that, oh, thanks, Jesus, I believe in Jesus, thank you, Jesus, and then just go on. And so that's thanks, but there's a big difference between thanks and thanksgiving. What is thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is about the overflowing love and in me that transforms me as a person, right? My whole life, that is going back to Jesus, thanking Him, giving praise to Him. Right? And so, you know, you look at that and we see that that is the Lord who is completely transforming and changing my whole life, my whole person. Right? And so, even in Christianity, we have a term for this. It's called being born again. It's called being born again. It's in the Bible. It's being born again. And so it's going back to Jesus, right? It's going back to Jesus for a, transform, a transformation in my life, right? And so that is, you know, that, that's what it's about. Being born again isn't about like, you know, thanks and then just going on, but it's really the overflowing love of Jesus in me that naturally overflows and love exhibiting itself. And so where does transformation start? You know, this transformation, this born again, this transformation, it's actually, you know, it may not seem like something big. It's not like big action and big things. We have to remember faith is not about actions and deeds. But, you know, the starting point very often, like where it actually like shows very often, is simply deep gratitude in the heart. Right? When we have deep gratitude in the heart, heart for God, for Jesus, for our brothers and sisters in church, for, you know, the great grace of my life, when thanksgiving overflows, what happens is that that 
actually starts many other transformations in my life. Right? Uh, my gratitude, thanksgiving overflows, even my life starts to change. Actions and other things I do start to change as well. Also. And then, so that's what we see the life of, of faith is. The life of faith is not my actions or deeds, but it's about the love in my heart. And then where it starts to show, perhaps, is the deep gratitude. And then the deep gratitude does turn into you know, actions and other things that I do as I give glory to God as well. So, and that's what transformation is. So that, that action that I do, we come to find, is not out of like my like, you know, mental desire that I just have to do this so that I can like, affirm my faith or something like this. It's not so complicated like that. But really, it's just Thanksgiving. Oh, I have thanks in my heart. I have thanksgiving, not just thanks, but I have thanksgiving in my heart, really overflowing. And so that's what the place of the church is. Church is that kind of place. People that are going back to Jesus once again, right? Like, I'm not just, like, giving thanks. I'm, like, giving, I want to go back to Jesus so that I can overflow with thanksgiving. And then when the church comes together like this, like we are, like we as a church, right? Then not only do we try, can we transform ourselves, but we can transform the city of San Francisco. I believe that our church can do this. Mm-hmm. And so today we have looked at the difference between thanks and thanksgiving. We've looked at the loneliness in our heart that can only be resolved through the Lord. And that as He comes in us, I pray that thankfulness, joy, and the peace of the love of God can overflow us. Let's not live like a, a leper colony, like lonely in the world. Let's have the overflowing heart of love. And as this gratitude and thanksgiving overflows, may it transform our life, may it transform the city, may we be the ones to live for God is glory. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your loving grace today. As we have uh, learned about uh, these lepers, Lord, we come to find that we are the spiritual lepers, so isolated and lonely and unloved ones in the world. But Lord, you are immediate to us. You came to us. It's not that we went to you, but you came to us. And Lord, accepting you into our heart, Lord, that is the overflowing we thanks and thanksgiving to the Lord that transforms us in our lives. And Lord, and Lord allow us to be these ones among us, brothers and sisters, to really overflow with thanksgiving, with the deep meaning of thanksgiving, that we cannot just give thanksgiving on our own, Lord, but it is only through your unconditional love on the cross that it overflows. Thank you, Lord, for your love.